Good afternoon, everyone. How is everyone doing? This is the uh, second part of the halftime show for the Super Bowl. Uh, so welcome. And uh, I'll be speaking. There'll be no lip syncing today. We'll all be speaking in real time, so with no tape delay. Uh, welcome to the Sustaining and Extending Health Reform, a symposium in honor of the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research and the work of Dr. E. Richard Brown, Rick, as we all know him, and the, the center's founding director. So we're all pleased that you could join us, and uh, thank you very much. What we thought we'd start with an opening plenary honoring Rick. I think it's an appropriate way to start the afternoon um, to celebrate Rick and his work and what he's created at the center of the entire team there and their body of work. And then in keeping with Rick's um, view of the world, we're going to get down to business after that and talk about the Affordable Care Act, which I think Rick and the center had such an important role in informing, um, providing guidance to the Obama administration and others. Um, so what we'll start with is uh, a tribute to Rick and a celebration of Rick and the center. And then we'll move through the day um, with an amazing panel of experts um, from the state and from the nation to talk about uh, the Affordable Care Act. First the panel will talk about sustaining the Affordable Care Act. And then the next panel will talk about, so where do we go from here? Because we know the Affordable Care Act did uh, many amazing things and is in the process of transforming the health system and expanding care to millions of Californians and Americans, but that work isn't finished. But let's get started with the, uh, the tributes and the fun stuff. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Diona Bonta, who is the new president and CEO of the California Wellness Foundation. Welcome. Um, <laughs> she previously served as the vice president of public affairs for Kaiser Permanente Southern California region, and before that was the director of California Department of Health Services and the director of health and human services in Long Beach, and has done many, many, many other things uh, in addition to those. So welcome to Diana and uh, I look forward to hearing her words. Thank you, Peter. Oops. We're gonna do headset switch. We're gonna do this. Okay, let's see. Okay. All right. This is like disco night. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So um, as Peter was introducing me, I thought, oh, for those of you who don't know me, you might think that I switch jobs a lot. It's true. <laughs> but um, some people, I know that I've taught many students, and some of them are here, former students in the audience. And what I say is that there are different career paths. And for some, it is to be with an institution over a number of years. And we're very fortunate that many people do that. And for others, they have sort of that wanderlust. And after a number of years, all their ideas have uh, been placed on the table, and maybe if you're lucky, a quarter of them are accepted, and the rest of people say, yeah, nice, but we're not gonna do that. So you have to go to different places and try them out. So hence, um, my newest gig at the California Wellness Foundation, and really very, very pleased to be there. And thank you, Peter. Uh, Peter's gonna, as a CEO and president of a foundation, he's gonna teach me the secret handshake a little bit later. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Well, let me, um, I know many of you are very familiar of the work of the center, but it, it, doesn't, um, it, it doesn't take away from this occasion to go over a little of things that you already know. And so I wanna start out by saying that the California Health Interview Survey is the largest health survey in the state and one of the largest health surveys in the country. Before the California Health Interview Study, that we had, we had uh, standard demographic information, state and county health department data. That's very important, it's useful information, but it didn't provide the full picture that we need to make good health decisions here in California. So I wanna take you back in that memory bubble to the dark ages before CHIS. And before CHIS was established, we could not accurately understand what was occurring for any number of health problems at the county level here in California. And we could also not compare information between counties and the state. And there's nothing like competition to get people revved up, especially if you're the last on a long list of counties in terms of your particular rates, in terms of 
how you are providing for access for health care, or how you're doing on uh, colon cancer screening. So having that ability to have compare and contrast and to have the information in a user-friendly modality was a start. We couldn't compare information in the dark ages before CHIS between ethnic groups and identify disparities in incidence of asthma, for instance, be able to look at usual sources of care, be able to identify mammography screening in a select population. And we know living here in California, that population may be a Hmong population, a Cambodian, Armenian population, African American, Latino, Asian, Pacific Islander population. It may be a gay population. We could go on into all the subgroups for information that we really need to know. And we could not use the data to measure success over time. Because when we try new programs and we try interventions, we need to know, are we hitting the mark? And the only way that you can do that is being able to have data over time that really gets to the nitty gritty of what the healthcare issues are or the issues by disease. And then being able to say, Okay, based upon this data, state of California, for instance, made this particular type of intervention, and as a consequence, there have been changes in the program. Now are people getting better results? And it's not just a, a feeling that it was the right thing to do, but you're able to measure it and to look at the consistencies. Before CHIS, there were inconsistencies in the numbers that we defined as uninsured in California. If you date back like me, you remember those discussions. Well, I think it's this. No, I think it's this. No, I think it's this. And it depended on your political persuasion. It depended on where you were working. Sometimes you wanted the numbers to be low. You didn't want to spend more money. Sometimes you wanted them to be high so you could advocate for your point of view. But what we need is accurate data, informed data, that would allow us to really address it and CHIS became the vehicle for that. And it is now the only definitive data source about health insurance in the state that I and many in this room would really go to. So in some states, some of our neighboring states, like Arizona, are sort of still in the dark ages. And um, the data that they have available is basic health status, vital statistics which means it's a report focused on reportable diseases, deaths, hospital inpatient discharges. And it means that the picture of health is not complete in Arizona because it does not factor in health behaviors, doesn't look at food issues, doesn't look at neighborhood safety issues, social cohesion, employment, and all of the elements that contribute to community health. Well, all of this didn't just happen on a whim. It came about by a vision. And the Center for Health Policy and Research with Rick Brown has delivered on his vision that we see here today in terms of some of the work that you'll be discussing, and certainly in terms of the vision that has led to program changes, programs to meet the data and analytical needs of those in the policy world, and has grown that vision to be inclusive of and understandable to those at the ground level working to improve health, community members, promotoras, and activists. So I'm saying that all of that got translated. Well, it didn't come about just like that. It came about because of good leadership. And Rick Brown has been the tenacious, scholarly leader of this effort. And I think part of the reason they invited me to speak here this morning is that I have actually worked in different places where I got to see Rick in action, coming to educate elected officials and to educate foundations and other decision makers about the significance of having robust data and making it attainable to people so that we could make good decisions. So let me take you back a little ways, and we're celebrating now the center since 19, 
94, and I happened to work in the city of Long Beach during that time. And we were just beginning to look at the Cambodian population and some of the issues that were coming there. And some of that dialogue that Rick was convening together people at the center was to say, how do we make the difference in access for all populations? Fast forward a little bit, followed in the footsteps of Kim Belcher, who's here, and was at the California Department of Health Services. And at that point, Rick really was moving on the chiz and being able to say, this is the direction that we need to have to be able to do telephone surveys, to have people that can gather this information and that we can dig deeper into subpopulations in the community to answer specific issues. And that's not an easy job sometimes to convey that in layperson's terms of some of the decision makers that need to understand why do this. And most funders, they think, well, okay, I'll fund that this year, right? But when you come to them with a project and you say, well, I really need you to understand this is a project in perpetuity, then they get a little nervous because it seems like a huge investment and how are they going to be able to sustain this? And is it, why would you need to sustain that kind of effort? Well, at Kaiser Permanente, I also got to see how CHIS was supported by that organization. It started in 2003, providing operational support and funding for survey administration. And by 2007, Kaiser's investments supported data collection related to some of the areas that they were interested in. And that included adult obesity and lifestyle factors, diet and exercise, because we were all seeing the epidemic, but not knowing exactly how should we channel some of our programs and our resources. Diabetes disease management. We know that with the increased numbers of persons that are obese, that our diabetes numbers have also increased. So being able to target again to populations. Food insecurity, social determinants of health, interpersonal violence, and access to health services. And during the course of the years, both in Northern California for Kaiser Permanente and for Southern California, nine grants equaled $2.7 million. So you can see, Another part of Rick's world was being a fundraiser. A scholar, a visionary, and a fundraiser to put it all together, and a mentor and leader of his staff members, because as he was doing this, it wasn't just him. Jerry Kaminsky, all of the staff members that I know in this forum, you'll get to hear about them. They were part of this journey as well, and they were able to bring in their perspectives to enrich the data. UCLA was, had the vision to embrace this project as well and to be able to go beyond the publishing data and information and know that they could take this project and really reach deep and meet the community needs as well. In 1994, early in the foundation's history, the California Wellness Foundation was also a partner. Over the years, I have been very pleased to find from my staff that we've made 19 grants totaling $3.4 million. And that's because the foundation really believes in this work. We have supported the production of key reports based on the CHIS, including the state of health insurance in California, a report that focused on such things as the health of women, including health status, health insurance coverage, preventive services, and access to care. The part that I think touches me the most, though, about the work of the CHIS has been that the grant supports that many, many organizations besides the state of California, Kaiser Permanente, and the California Wellness Foundation have done to support this efforts has been the grassroots efforts because what has occurred through the center is to take the work and educate thousands of people about basic information and data. And that has been a world that has not been available to the community. You know, we usually have people with PhDs and 
MDs and doctorates come and um, say to the community, we need to partner with you. But we haven't had organizations who have taken the ability of that partnership to change it to say, let us work with you to give you the tools so that you yourself can manipulate the data, so that you yourselves can ask the question. So I had the pleasure of being the chair of the CHIS Advisory Committee because way back when, Rick was able to say, I don't want to do this in a void. I want to bring in leaders throughout the state of California. And he did in terms of us coming together and asking the questions. And then the voice of the community was part of that because the community was able to ask the questions online and say, I want to use the data for this. I want to explore these different areas. And in that, they could do this wonderful work. I want to just close in talking a little bit more about Rick. And I know the afternoon is going to include that as well later on. Um, his leadership, as I said, has been instrumental. All the support in the world doesn't make a difference unless you have visionary leadership and a team of committed people who take that vision to the next level. And that vision has allowed the work of the center to really move in the key issues related to the public and to policymakers and to helping them understand the scope and scale of many health behaviors and conditions. I mentioned it's helped us in the foundation world to understand where we can have an impact because looking at the information, foundations then can make a decision on an approach based upon information that they're receiving so that they can target limited monies in the state of California. And based upon this, the longevity of the project, we can see the changes over time in communities. Too often I look at HEDIS measures and other uh, measures and we are not still getting robust enough about disparities and really looking at different ethnicities. It's not enough to have great mammography screening rates if you still have women in a particular subgroup who are not getting the mammography early enough, maybe getting the treatment at the end, but they had to have more intensive treatment because they weren't screened. And so this pushes the envelope in the right fashion. We are on the brink of a new era of healthcare in California. It's an exciting time. The investment of Rick Brown's vision and in the work of the Center for Health Policy Research has been a solid one. The work of the center has paid, played a pivotal role in shifting the focus to the systemic issues that cause poor health and the potential ways in which interventions might improve health and reduce inequity. I want to say that it's a tribute, Rick, to you that this room is full of so many people who over the age, over the time that we've spent together and will continue to, that we've seen changes here in California. California has led the country because of your efforts, the efforts of staff. I know that all of us are celebrating that Jerry Kaminsky will continue the traditions of the center and that you are passing the baton to the best of leadership here in California that UCLA has a commitment to this, and that all of us, represented by Peter and I and so many agencies here in the audience, are grateful for your vision, grateful that you were tenacious, grateful that you had the patience at times to re-explain to us why this was important. And on behalf of all the patients whose lives you made a difference in, the people that we won't even get to know on the levels that their lives have been changed because they opened up themselves on a telephone interview, sometimes in their native language, to talk about why they didn't go to the doctor, why it was a burden because of lack of transportation or lack of access to a pharmacy. And their stories and their tears have made changes here over the last 20 years in California 
by us taking a look, having that reality hit us in the face, and then making the bold moves to make the changes. Without the work that this center has done, that would not have come about. So on behalf of all of us, but especially the patients, Rick, we thank you very much. Thanks very much, Diana. Um, it's an honor to be here uh, with you today to celebrate Rick, welcome Jerry, and to recognize the tremendous accomplishments of the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. I knew about the center long before I came to UCLA as a graduate student in uh, 2000, when I was a policy analyst with the Medi Kaiser Medicaid Commission in Washington, DC. I started reading everything that the, every policy brief that the center put out to understand what was happening here in California. Because um, even at that time, we knew that what happened in California influenced the country um, and was typically ahead in the thinking, if not always in all of the uh, policies, but certainly the thinking and the research was happening in California. Then I came to UCLA as a grad student, a PhD student, and had the pleasure of working with Jerry um, at the Center on Health Impact Assessment and Health Forecasting. Um, and went back into the foundation world and lo and behold got to fund CHIS that Deanna was talking about and serve on the advisory committee when I was at the California Endowment. And really, from the endowment's perspective, sharing very much the perspective of the California Wellness uh, Foundation of the deep and powerful impact that data at a, a local level, you know, kind of real-time data at a local level on populations that we don't normally uh, get to know about and get to understand how powerful that was in a transformation agenda. And you can see that so many institutions and so many organizations, whether they public or private, have built their uh, campaigns, built their programs, built their policies around what we've learned from CHIS. So I think I can't underscore enough the power of information, quality information directly derived from people and their experiences, their aspirations, their expectations, how transformational that has been to health policy in California and thanks to Rick's evangelism to many other states around the country now. Um, there's an old saying in politics that politics makes for strange bedfellows. Uh, in healthcare, we now use strange bedfellow term to describe any grouping of individuals that's unexpected. Um, our most recent example of strange bedfellows was that with health reform in the waning days. Uh, the SEIU got together with the National Federation of Independent Businesses and said, divided we fail. Um, and everyone you know, hailed that and we've seen family, Ron Pollock is in a strange bed uh, at Families USA every month or two with different folks uh, with hospitals and things. Um, I want to test a hypothesis with you today that I think the uh, center has, been, has had impressive accomplishments and it's incredible longevity because it is a strange bedfellow. Um, I asked my wife if I could say Rick was a strange bedfellow, extending the metaphor, and she told me that was entirely inappropriate for an afternoon crowd. Um, so I'm going to test the hypothesis that the success of the center uh, is achieved partly because it's dualism. And part of it, Deanna captured, I just want to bring it into stark relief. Some of the, the inherent tensions and contradictions, I think, make the center as creative and as powerful and impactful as it is. The first I would subscribe is that there are very few institutions that get to actively engage in health policy advocacy and at the same time produce the highest level of impeccable health policy research. You don't get to do that in the world normally. Normally you need to make a choice. Are you taking a position on an issue? Are you in the fight? Are you driving on behalf of a particular position or population or uh, approach to a problem? Or are you the neutral party that's providing the information, just the facts, ma'am, and here we are, we're providing the data, let you, the policymaker, or you, the advocate, actually make your own decisions? Well, amazingly, for an 18-year period, the center has done both amazingly well. Um, they have a very clear point of view, and I think one that we all in this room would agree with about the dignity of people having good health and access to health care. And some at this table might even go so far as to say that they should have a single payer healthcare system. Um, at the same time, you heard from Diana about the ability and the creation of CHIS over the last 10 years has become the seminal, 
de facto research, uh, piece of information and research. It is beyond reproach, the data that comes from CHIS and the data that comes through, from the center through the policy, uh, policy briefs and policy research. Policymakers on both sides of the aisle use their data, use their analysis, use their research uh, all the time. I would say to me that's like crossing the Kaiser Family Foundation, who is assiduously neutral with Families USA, and, and create an institution. It's a little like having a labradoodle um, <laughs> that is smart, cute, and hypoallergenic. <laughs> as a health policy researcher and as a student of Mark Peterson, who's here, who studies some political science, I'm not sure how that works, but I'm incredibly thankful that that combination of both being able to do advocacy and take a position as well as provide impeccable research to the fact that it does work. The second dualism I would point out, and I think this is a testament to Rick as well, is the center is populated with both thinkers and doers. Um, and again, in the world, we have a lot of thinkers and speakers, and then there are folks who are out there on the ground doing things. And Diana, in her remarks, alluded a little bit to that about the health data sessions and taking data to the communities. Um, in UCLA, we have many brilliant minds that create new theories, challenging existing ones, publish many, many articles in the literature. Um, there are also lots of scientists, doctors, artists who are creating things, who are pragmatists. I think what Rick has created in the center is a home that both types of folks are welcome, and even within individuals, you're allowed to express both your high-minded thoughts, but also your real activism to be relevant to the policy discussions that are happening today and the issues that are happening in communities in California. So I think it is a remarkable to think about an institution that welcomes and embraces people who think high thoughts and do real work. Um, and hopefully in the world, we, it would be not such a strange thing if we actually had more of that. The third, I think probably most remarkable to me, um, I, I spent a lot of time in the health policy environment, whether in, in my career in, in health services research, there are very few institutions that are able to play a meaningful role in all facets of a policy debate. Um, and I would subscribe that the center is probably one of the best I've seen at doing that. So what I mean by that is there's a first part of the policy debate is what is even the agenda? And so in the dark days that Deanna described before 1994 the center was created, people didn't actually know the agenda was we didn't have data on what we didn't know. As Donald Rumfield would say, we didn't know what we didn't know. Um, and so the center, Rick and the center were able to create the agenda that a shared information base and real credible research that allows us detailed a uh, snapshot of California, a detailed movie in a sense over time, is actually going to drive health policy for the next two decades and beyond. So it's a unique skill to be able to set that agenda, to see into the future and say, this is actually what we need. This is where we're going to move forward. It's a whole different set of skills to be involved in the rough and tumble of a policy debate. And I think Rick can, if he rolls up his sleeves, can show us the bruises and the scars from each of the policy debates, whether it was in the Clinton White House or with the Obama administration, or with some of the senators, Kerry and Franken and Wellstone and others, um, it's a totally different skill set about the art of compromise. What's the art of the possible that we can do? It's not the big picture thinking and we're all going to come together. It's actually what can we push through an agenda, a legislative agenda, and get signed by the executive. Um, and the center, again, has been incredibly useful in each of the major policy debates, whether it was in California, um, around children, around all Californians, or whether it was the bookended healthcare reform debates nationally. And then it's an entirely different skill set, which is where we are today in policy implementation, because um, that's actually about getting it done. That's about the details. That is about how things play out in communities. So it's the big picture folks who are the agenda setters, thank you very much. It's now time to see what does that mean for this community health center in Fresno? Well, what does this mean for the mom community outside Sacramento? How will this translate into their lives? And so I think one of the strangest um, bedfellows is the fact that the center has been able to play a constructive role in every facet of the policy debate. My final observation is that, and this is from Rick himself, I had the pleasure of having lunch with Rick last week where we talked about funding for CHIS. Um, so for the staff, David, you'll be, you'll, he was on task, and uh, we're talking about not just funding for this year's CHIS, but for the next installation as well. Ten years. Exactly. Um, is that the center is both a policy entrepreneur, and Rick in particular is a policy entre entrepreneur and an institution builder. 
And we all know folks who have wonderful ideas and who are thinking about the next big thing, whether that be CHIS or whether that be a, a policy implementation around the, the obesity or public health and prevention. Um, and we all know lots, lots of people who build institutions, who worry about indirect cost and HR and square footage and moving the center off campus and figuring out what the indirect rate is there and hiring folks and mentoring them um, and building that institution. And I think what's remarkable and why we're here 18 years later and celebrating the accomplishments is that Rick has been able to seamlessly do both um, or hire people to do both, but that's a good thing as well. But I think <laughs> to the credit to the staff there. So I hope that you at least uh, accept part of my hypothesis um, or at least have gotten a sense of the, the powerful dualisms of the center. I'd be remiss, though, if I didn't take, go down a notch. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't take a moment to tick off some of the accomplishments. And I thought the simplest way to do that and, um, was rather than going back in history and looking at it, I said, let's just take a snapshot of January 2012 and let's look at what the center's been working on um, in their monthly newsletter. And to give you a flavor for how relevant they are to the policy discussions we're having today. So item number one is center of research on individual mandate, health reform, inform the Supreme, Court, Supreme Court's amicus brief. That's pretty policy relevant, don't you think? <laughs> um, I mean, we are talking about the Supreme Court and the individual mandate. It's kind of important for health reform. And the center, at the, at the heart of it, using CHIS data, um, built the forecasting model to, to understand what would happen if we don't have the mandate, if the Supreme Court strikes it down. So that's pretty good. You know, I would say that's a, that's a good month's work for folks, but the center did a lot more than that. Um, they also looked at family cancer risk using the new CHIS variable, actually look at population risk in families. And as the son of a, a dad who died recently of tongue and throat cancer, I'm very concerned about family uh, prevalence for cancer. So that's a personal one to me. This isn't just high-minded things. This is about each of us in our own health and our own experience. And so this breakthrough, methodologic breakthrough on CHIS has real implications for people's peace of mind and for their screening and how they actually go about their lives. But there's more. This was a busy month. Um, they also, we've had a big conversation in California about home care, adult day health care. And so the center looked at, well, what are the implications for people getting out of their homes? Um, so not necessarily page one of the policy issues, but another issue that affects millions of Californians and the families who have to take care of the folks, understanding what the implications of a policy decision are. Gets better. Um, in Calaveras County, they're working to actually, with the county, to how do you use CHIS to understand their unique is health issues to plan for the future. Um, and there's more. They actually announced this event and they all got you here, which that was a success as well. But, and then I also note 13 media mentions um, from the LA Times, Sacramento Bee, Healthy Cow, all the major distributions. That was one month. So let's take that times 18 years, times 12, that's, uh, you know, we can think about the impressive list of accomplishments for the center. I want to say the center, though, is not only good at policy, they're pretty darn good at marketing. This week, and I, I would actually, if there's an award for marketing for health policy centers at major academic institutions, I would submit the center would be pretty close to the top. In this week alone, I have a magnet on my fridge, Center for Health Policy Research, holding a picture of my son. Um, that was a good start. I have a bookmark in the notes I took from the CHIS bookmark, having asked CHIS and how I should use Ask CHIS. I wrote my notes today with a pen from the center, with a nice pullout. Um, and the first article when I opened my email today was about medical debt and the center's study on medical debt in, in it. Uh, and yesterday I spent the day, um, this is now a week of honoring Rick, so I would declare this Rick Brown week. I um, honored Rick at the uh, ITUP conference, which is the leading health policy conference in the state. Let me close, though, with something a little more serious about Rick's leadership style, just to, to focus on that, because I think it really is important and central to, to, to the success of why we're here. It's, it's, oops, it's rare to find an iconic leader who's also a terrific mentor in the same person. Here we go. Big finish, big close. We're going to go. Okay. Um, I want to finish with just a little uh, more serious about Rick and, and who he embodies as a person and why this is, um, why we are here today and why the center has been so successful. It's rare that you find an iconic leader, and Rick is iconic, um, and a terrific mentor in the same person. Back to my strange bedfellow theme. Um, Rick has served as a dynamic and pioneering, pioneering leader of the center for 18 years. 
He's also allowed room for those around him like Jerry and Steve and Dylan and Nadi and Shana to grow and develop and be leaders in their own right. His approach has ensured that the center is strong today and will be strong into the future. In philosophy, the conscious self is seen as coming to terms with being in a material world, with encountering external forces, pressures, and influences that can be very different from you. Authenticity is the degree to which one is true to one's own personality, spirit, or character, despite these pressures. I would submit that Rick is an authentic actor in a healthcare world that is full of external pressures that may not be recognizable to him. So for the dualisms, the impressive accomplishments, and the authenticity, I'm very appreciative that the center was created, exists today, and will continue to flourish into the future. My best wishes for Rick Jerry and the entire team. Thank you. So what can I say? Um, I want to start by saying thank you. Um, thank you to Deanna and thank you to Peter. Thank you to Jerry and to all the folks in the Center for Health Policy Research. Um, I may have been the leader of the center, but the, all of the work that Peter and Deanna talked about, that's really the work of other people. Uh, and these are the people who actually bring the competence the commitment and their own vision to make sure that the center is producing high quality data and high quality research that's very relevant to the debates of the day. Um, what does it mean to conduct, conduct health policy research in a school of public health? Faculty and students in a public health school come from many different disciplines, but they share something in common. What they share in common is a commitment to improving the health of the whole population and increasing equity in society is a key means of accomplishing that goal. And improving equity means reducing disparities, social disparities in health and in access to health care. To paraphrase the title of an article by Dan Beauchamp published in 1976, Public health is social justice. And that has been the guiding principle that I have had and that so many of us have had doing health policy work in the School of Public Health. Why did we start the Center for Health Policy Research? We did it in 1994 because there wasn't a strong vehicle for faculty and students and researchers who were interested in improving health policy to actually have a voice in, that, in the debates. Um, and we had very strong encouragement from, at the time, Dean Afifi, who um, said to me, Rick, you know that center you wanted to start? I think this is the time to go do it. I had just come back from six months in Washington working on health care reform. Uh, it was a very high issue high on the agenda, an issue high on the agenda. And it was very clear that there was a need for this kind of work. My interest in this work came out of work I had started a decade before uh, as a faculty member in the School of Public Health uh, with other colleagues when we looked at the issues about the uninsured in California issues about why people were having so much difficulty getting access to care and access to health insurance. We looked around and we said, there really isn't good data on this and there isn't any research on it. And so we formed a team and we started to produce research on health insurance coverage and the uninsured in California. But beyond that, we started to also work with an, a, 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 a multi-campus organization at the time called the California Policy Seminar that funded our work at a very modest level, but also put out the products of our work directly to policy audiences. And I saw the power of that. I also saw the power of publishing new research studies on these issues and watching the news media, 
watching advocates, and watching, watching key legislators and policy leaders say, this is an important issue. We need to address this issue. And it helped to elevate an issue onto the policy agenda. That was the formative lesson to me. And so when it came to 1994, and Dean Afifi at the time said, you ought to start the center, I thought that was a brilliant idea. Deanna Bonta's new uh, institution, the California Wellness Foundation, actually provided the first grant to the center that enabled us to get it started. And um, we got it started, and one of the things we built in was direct to policy audience communication. And that was really critical to accomplish the things that Peter and Deanna spoke about. Uh, that we spoke directly to policy audiences, and we didn't do it just with journal articles. We didn't just publish journal articles and send them out to people. Those wouldn't mean anything to people. We crafted policy documents, like policy briefs, that people could understand and find accessible and learn from and use in their own work. And so we have always seen our mission as trying to achieve universal coverage with high quality health care that actually improves health outcomes and to work to provide that data and those analyses and those studies into the hands of people who actually can use it. Because most re researchers don't really use the results of their data except to get the next grant to do the next study uh, to produce the next articles. And so we saw this as a means of directly informing policy advocacy and policy development, and it proved to be a useful combination. Um, but it wasn't very long before, in working with state partners in the California Department of Health Services then, we came to see that there were tremendous limitations in the data that was available to inform this kind of policy work in California, at the state level, but even more so at the local level. And although there was reasonable data on certain populations, there was no data on populations that were key in California. California, even then, was a very diverse state. Not quite as diverse as it is today, but it was still the most diverse state on the mainland US. And we provided data through the California Health Interview Survey for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, but not just as a lumped together population, but as subgroups that were important to each of the subgroups, and identifying differences, important differences in health and access to care across these different ethnic subgroups, and the same for Latinos as well. So that was our mission, and uh, those were the things we sought to accomplish, and I think I feel very pleased that we have gotten a long way there. Uh, we have had tremendous help along the way, and I do want to tell a brief story about how CHIS actually got started. I'd been working on planning CHIS with two colleagues from the Public Health Institute who are here today, Elaine Holtby, and, I'm sorry, Sue Holtby and Elaine Zond, and uh, Peter Abbott from the State Department of Health Services. But when it came to producing a document that could actually lead to the, to the development of this brand new survey in California, we had to get money and we had to get state money. So one of the places we went was to the state budget. And um, it's not easy to get money from the state budget, uh, let me tell you. And I think Kim Belche knows that, Deanna <laughs> knows that, Anthony Wright knows that. Um, it's very closely guarded by an agency who's tasked with saying no, always no. That's the Department of Finance. And um, so we had a proposal in for a budget change that would start to fund CHIS in perpetuity. Not the whole amount, but a significant piece of it that would let us get started. And uh, there was a lot of you know, question about whether the state should really do this. The governor was on, not on board yet. But his chief of staff, Susan Kennedy, uh, was willing to meet with me. And uh, also included in that meeting, Deanna Bonta, who was then the director of the Department of Health Services. And I went in very high, you know, getting a meeting with the chief of staff and the governor to pitch uh, this new survey. 
I did the pitch, and um, Deanna was very supportive. And at the end of the meeting, Susan Kennedy said, congratulations, you got your funding. I went out, I was really high. I mean, you can imagine how pleased I was with myself for having made such a good pitch. <laughs> Little did I know that 30 minutes later, the Department of Finance was starting to send a barrage of emails to the governor's office saying, don't do it. Don't do it because that survey will only start to identify new needs that will become new demands on the general fund. Don't fund it. And um, every one of those emails, Deanna batted back with arguments about why this survey was needed, why it would help California, and why it was important to do. And it was Deanna's persistence, her advocacy for evidence-based policy that won the day and got CHIS its first funding from the state. We, we always thank you for that, Deanna. Um, and uh, so I, I want to close by just thanking all of you who are here uh, coming to this, this symposium. Uh, uh, Drs. Rick Kronick and Robert Kaplan, who actually came from Washington, D.C. for it. Uh, Kim Belche, Anthony Wright, and Sandra Shuri, who came from Sacramento. Um, and Peter Long uh, and Andy Beinman from the Bay Area. Uh, I am very grateful to all of you. I'm especially grateful to the tremendous team at the Center for Health Policy Research. Uh, Jerry Kaminsky, Steve Wallace, um, leading terrific research uh, in, a, in a set of areas that I know nothing about. And so all of that great work that Peter was identifying really had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with them and the team of researchers who work with them. And I also want to thank my family, uh, my wife Mary Ann, who has been a support throughout these years, my two daughters. My two daughters, Delia Brown and Adrian Faxio, uh, who have been wonderful supports and um, the, the light of my life for uh, as long as they've been on this earth. And my newest support, uh, my granddaughter, Makeda Faxio, who uh, is, is, as you can see, uh, a shining light and, and a lot of energy. So with all of that, I want to thank you for being here, and um, uh, thank you, Peter, and thank you, Deanna. Sure.